history of our church, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16, and I want to read that very familiar, familiar passage beginning with verse 13, Matthew 16. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. May the Lord's richest blessing be to his word, and may it be sanctified in our hearts. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity we have now to come to gather around your word. We pray that you might open it to us. We might see unsearchable truths that we can never know apart from divine revelation. Speak a good word that will lift the hearts, the minds, the souls, the spirits of your people today and strengthen them to be the strong, towering disciples of Christ that are so desperately needed in this hour in which we live. Open-hearted man, that woman, that boy or girl who's never come to faith in Christ, they might believe today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> I want to speak this morning uh, just briefly from uh, a simple subject. Is the church relevant in the 21st century? Is the church relevant in the 21st century? That is a question that is circulating in the circles of many young people today, middle-aged and older people alike. The question is whether or not the church is still relevant in the 21st century? Or has it become merely a relic from antiquity? Has it lost its relevancy in no longer relating to the problems, the issues, the challenges, the situations, circumstances that individuals and that families face today? And so it is a question that the church must entertain, are we still relevant today? in the 21st century. If we were to be removed from the earth, how long would it take for people to notice that we were gone? And I think that becomes a, a benchmark of the relevance of an institution, is whether or not it would be missed it was, if it would discontinue, if it no longer existed. There's no question that the church in America faces really a lot of challenges, particularly in our communities, in African-American communities and in low-income communities. Because church attendance is at maybe an all-time low in the United States of America. Even some of the churches that are growing numerically, it's not salvation growth, it's transfer growth. They got a bigger choir, they got better musicians. They got a, a younger, more dynamic, more, a, a more handsome preacher. Or someone over here make me mad. So I'm going to go over here. 
to be with somebody else. And that's what a lot of the church movement, what a lot of the church activity today, it is transfer growth, people moving back and forth, bobbing and weaving, but we're not having the impact that we once had in terms of conversion growth, in terms of baptism, new people being added to the church roles. And so the question that begs for a response, is the church relevant in the 21st century? Does it speak to the pressing needs that people feel where they realize I need to be a part of an institution that is bigger than what I am, that identifies with Jesus Christ and his gospel and his work, and I want to be a part of the institution. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to tell you right now, you know what my thesis is. The church is very much relevant, and it is very much needed today. And every week or so, it becomes obvious to me that be the case. Because every time someone dies, in this community in particular, or in a community nearby, normally the first place that people call is the church, either this one or another church. They recognize in their time of great need, of great brokenness, and of great bereavement, that they some kind of way want to see if they can make it back to the church. They, go, could, they could go to the embassy suite. They got much better meeting rooms. They got much more sophisticated ambiance. Uh, they could go to Western State University and rent a room or maybe go to Bridge Valley Community and Technical College or go to some social place. But in the dark hours, most people, even if the loved one that's deceased, deceased haven't done the doors of a church in years, they want to make it back to the church. And for me, that is a sign that the church still has a relevance. It still has a place that when people are the most broken, the most hurting, the most disturbed, the most distraught, they're still hoping that maybe there is a word from God. That maybe God can speak into this darkness, that God can speak into this grief, into this heaviness, Maybe God can speak into this great sense of loss and fill this void that's in my heart, in my soul, and in my spirit. The church still has relevance as long as people are realizing that when people leave this earth, we're trying to fill out, figure out, is there a word from eternity? There's always a place for the church of the living God. Even when the society no longer recognize or truly value its worth, its worth to them individually, its worth to the community, its worth to the society. If they were to close the doors of all the 25 churches, give or take a few, that's located on this west side of Charleston, if you think things are bad now, let the doors of the church be closed. Let there not be a light in the midst of the darkness, an oasis in a desert and dry place. Let that not there be a people that are concerned, still concerned about the people and trying to give a sense of hope and trying to throw out the lifeline that will connect people to salvation. Things can get a lot worse and a lot darker, a lot faster than what the decay is certainly currently happening in this community, in other communities, all over the United States of America. Don't think that we are some anomaly. You go to any challenged communities and they are in serious decline, serious decay, decay disinvestment, out-migration, people leaving. People no longer want to be a part of a place where there's a lot of problems. And then we go into other neighborhoods a lot more affluent, you also still see a, a spiritual decline that is taking place. That is taking place all over this land as the church and as the, the Bible in particular no longer have a, a place in the lives of many people. So the relevance of the church for the 21st century will always be there as long as the church has a firm commitment 
to trying to delve into the text of the Bible, to try to find the, the timeless principles and truths of the Bible and apply them to the real life situations of the world to show people that God still speaks, that God speaks as contemporaneously, as fresh, that God is as relevant today as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Charleston Gazette Mail, that there is a word from God, and that's what the church must always stand on. So we have a tendency to think that things are only bad in our time. Things have always been bad. <laughs> There's always been a bad situation, a bad scenario that existed. So when people talk about going back to the good old days, well, the good old days were not so good for some people. There were some people that always suffered. I don't care what the time was in this country. I don't know how far you go back into, into history. There's always been the best of times and the worst of times. But for us as a people and as a people group, then the worst of times, we were anchored in spiritual soil. We were built on a solid foundation. We still believe that God heard our prayer and God heard our cry and somehow, some way, God would make a difference and he would be the difference and that God would come through just in the nick of time. So during Jesus' earthly ministry, don't think it was no paradise for the Jewish people. Don't think it was a paradise for those who waited for the Messiah to come, who really was wanting the Lord to come and deliver them from the oppression of the Roman government and from the exploitation of the religious leaders. They were in a bad situation. Their back was up against the wall. They were in a, in a, in a, between a rock and a hard place. It wasn't easy for them at all. But they had held on to their faith, and Christ had showed up. John had presented him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So he starts his itinerant ministry in Nazareth of Galilee, going across the countryside, a very humble, very meager little movement, just a band of disciples, no one with any credentials, no one with any social, political, cultural cachet. All they had was a faith that they believed that God had heard their cry, God had sent them their Messiah, and that wherever he would lead, they would follow, not knowing exactly where the journey was headed. That was nothing sophisticated about them, Sister Mitchell. That was nothing influential about them. They just believed God, and they believed that God had sent the Messiah and that he had the word of the Lord and that the word of God was going to bring salvation and hope and deliverance and healing into the lives of the people. So after nearly three years of this movement, Jesus then decides to touch base, Mother Tolliver, with his disciples and make sure do they really understand who they've signed up with and what they have signed up for and what they are part of really is something significant. It's much larger than what they think. It's not just a social, a political, or a cultural movement, but it is a spiritual revolution that's going to actually ultimately usher in the kingdom of God. I shared with you before that we as members of the church in the 21st century, we often underestimate the significance of the role that we have as the people of God, the continuation of the life of Jesus Christ. That God in the person of Christ and the Holy Spirit come down out of heaven. Now he lives inside of us individually and inside of us corporately and that we are the continuation of his life trying to bring to bear the standards of his kingdom, trying to present his love offer salvation to those who will believe. Show the mercy of God, the grace of God, and the compassion of God in the name of Jesus Christ. So the early disciples, they really hadn't captured Deacon Chauncey, the, the real significance of this movement because they thought they were just bringing in a political movement. You got to understand, what they wanted was a political movement. They wanted the Israel to once again have its independence as a nation, once again, to be the envy of the world. They wanted to see a king sitting on the throne. They wanted to see other nations, basically, uh, humble before them. That's what they wanted to see. They were not as concerned about a spiritual revolution that Jesus really came to offer. So he's touching base with them, Brother Brian, here in Matthew chapter 16. And he pauses at Caesarea Philippi, and he asked him a question. 
Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? The most poignant, the most significant, the most profound question that Jesus ever asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And their response was impressive. They said, well, Jesus, the latest poll got you ranked up there pretty high. You're in pretty good company. And they mentioned, arguably, the three most revered prophets in the history of Israel. One was a contemporary of Jesus, John the Baptist, who had had a popularity like no other rabbi during that time. John technically was the last of the Old Testament prophets just before the Messiah would appear on the scene. And John had a regal courage and boldness about him that just was like a magnet that drew the people because there had not been a prophet like John for over 400 years that stood and just declared what the word of God said and applied the word of God so precisely that there was no way that the people could be confused about what he was saying. So much so that there were some who thought that John was the Messiah himself because of the courage and the profundity and the accuracy in which John thundered the truth of God. John was so impactful that after John had been beheaded by Herod, after John was dead and buried, that when Jesus came on the scene and ascended to popularity, Herod and others said, this is John who'd gotten up from the dead. Now that's how bad John was. And that's the fear that John had sent through the social political leaders of the day with his mere preaching of the word of God. And what is significant is, unlike Elijah, unlike Elisha, the two most prominent Old Testament prophets, John never performed a single miracle, never turned water into wine, never healed anybody, never multiplied fish and loaves. All John had was his courage and the word of God, and the word of God ministering through John was so powerful that it pierced the hearts of people so they were broken and convicted and came to him crying out, what must we do to be saved? Now John becomes a prototype for us in the 21st century where everybody seeking after miracles and trying to do miraculous things and trying to do supernatural things and trying to impress people with the crowds. There has to be a band of people that believe that the word of God is still in itself, it has this intrinsic power that in the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God and the salvation of everybody that believes. And we still believe that when we declare it, when we share it, that God the Holy Spirit can take that word of the living God, apply it to people's hearts and minds, souls and spirits, arrest them that need to be saved, and show them that Christ is the only hope of glory. And that's what John did. So they thought that they were flattering Jesus. Jesus, you're an elevated company. Some people are mentioning you in the same name as John the Baptist. You ought to be impressed with that. But not only that, some say that you're John, and others say that you're Elijah. Jesus' ministry, his persona, it was so complicated, it was hard to put him in a box. On the one hand, he had the courage the boldness to challenge the most powerful people in society and not blink, not stutter, but to say to the religious leaders that you're like dead man's bones. You're hypocrites, which could have been a death sentence, which ultimately was a death sentence. But on the other hand, he had this power that Elijah had and that Elijah had. He performed miracles. He healed the maimed, the halt, the blind, the deaf raised a few people from the dead. So it's this supernatural ability that credentialed him as this otherworldly individual. So some say he's like John on the one hand, but unlike John, he's performing miracles. He's like Elijah on the other hand. Again, this was an attempt to impress Jesus. And then the third dominant part of Jesus' personality was his compassion. John the Baptist didn't cry for nobody. 
Elijah didn't cry over nobody. But Jesus wept over the condition of Jerusalem. He wept over the condition of the city. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I would have gathered you in like a mother hen would gather in her chickens, but you just wouldn't come. So the thought of judgment coming upon the nation of Israel, the thought of judgment coming upon Jerusalem, the beloved city, it broke Jesus' heart. And he wept over the fact that judgment was going to come because of the hardness of people's heart. So he wept over the condition of Jerusalem and the nation. John the Baptist and Elijah, on the other hand, they prayed to God to bring down fire out of heaven to consume up the people that were the rebels and the stiff necked and the hard heartedness. But Jesus had this compassion of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. And so this composite of John the Baptist, this bold and regal, confrontational, fearless individual, Elijah, this miracle worker, and then there was Jeremiah, who had been a priest and trained as, trained as a priest and had been brought up in the priesthood, so he had a love and a compassion for the people, and he wanted to be the best for the people. And so when the people saw the compassion of Jesus, something he reminded us of Jeremiah. So this trilogy of individuals, this, this composite of personalities, is when people looked at Christ, depending on when they saw him and what he was doing, they saw a dominant part of his character manifest. So disciples, they put all that together, and they say, Jesus, you're in pretty high company. You will feel pretty good about yourself. You're polling pretty high. Any of the political candidates would love to have polled up there with John the Baptist, Elijah, and Jeremiah. Jesus should have been pleased, so thought the disciples. But then he asked them the second part of that question. But who do you say that I am? It's not how I poll in opinion polls, but who do you really say that I am? And at the end of the day, this becomes the essence of the Christian faith. This becomes the battle line and the battleground. Who really is Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Who do you say that I am? And this is the question of salvation. It's not whether people go to church or not, Mother Austin. It's not even whether they believe the Bible or not. I think they should. It's not whether they pray or not, fast or not. The question is, what have you done with Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Who do you say that he is? And that is the confusion that now exists in our society, where many are wanting to say, well, he was a good teacher, a good moral leader, that we ought to ascribe to live by the golden rule that he laid out, but I don't believe that he was really God in the flesh, that he was the Christ. I don't believe that one man dying and shedding his blood could atone for the sins of the whole world, and I don't see why y'all get so caught up on who Jesus is, on his cent centrality to your belief system, on, on him being the, the center of everything about religion. You re accept him or you reject him. And that's ultimately going to be the great line of division in our country. We're moving toward a place to where those of us who believe in the exclusivity of faith in Christ as the only means of salvation, we're going to be viewed as narrow-minded bigots, intolerable, non-inclusive. Let's just all get along together and just everybody believe what they want to believe. And I believe that everybody can believe what they want to believe. But as a church, we have an obligation to declare what we believe the truth of the Bible is regarding salvation because we get nothing right. We got to give people opportunity to get right with God. Were they baptized in the name of Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, sideways, backwards, upside down? Were they sprinkled, dipped? You know, spray holes with water holes, that come, becomes secondary. The question is, what do you think about Jesus? Who is he? Simon Peter's response, I'm going to wrap it up here in a couple minutes. You are the Christ, the Christos, the Greek equivalent of Messiah, the anointed one. 
the son of the living God. And Jesus responded to Peter and said, Blessed are you, someone by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Is the church relevant in the 21st century? Is the church relevant in Charleston, West Virginia? Is the church relevant on the west side of Charleston? You better believe it is. Because people need to hear a clear articulation of the gospel. They need to hear that the wages of sin is death. Separation from God for all of time and eternity. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. People need to hear that. And people need to hear the urgency of salvation. That now is the time of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Don't harden your heart. Don't wait. Don't postpone it. Don't assume that you got another service or another meeting will get another opportunity. That's why the church will be relevant. The message that we declare is the only message, the only hope of salvation. And we must recapture a zeal and a fervency to share that message, even if it appears that people don't want to hear it. We're not responsible for people's response. We are responsible for our delivery of the goods, our faithfulness and putting the goods out there to give the people the opportunity to hear and the opportunity to be saved. Jesus said to Simon, you're blessed, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And this is the verse I was trying to get to. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So Jesus says to Peter, you are, you are Peter, you are, you, are, you are a little stone. And upon this rock, upon this massive Gibraltar, and the massive the Gibraltar is the revelation that's been given to you by my Father. The foundation of the church is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That is the rock upon which the church is built. It's built upon the person, upon the work of who Jesus Christ is. And this revelation that God gave to Peter is the revelation that's been passed down from the church from generation to generation. And then Jesus says to him, as I prepare to close, upon this rock I will build my church. Why is the church relevant? The church is relevant because its founder, its architect, and its builder is Jesus Christ himself. The church is relevant is because the founder, the architect, and the builder of it is Jesus Christ himself. And he says to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. It is relevant because its founder, its architect, and its builder is Jesus Christ, and the owner is Jesus Christ. And there's no other institution that can lay the claim that the church can lay that our founder is God, the architect is God, the builder is God, the owner is God, and he gave it permanency. There's a lot of great and wonderful institutions. And some of you are part of some of those great and wonderful institutions. And they do some great and wonderful work. But there's not a single one of them that can say that God is the founder, the architect, the builder, and the sustainer of that institution. And it has the permanence, that Jesus said, of all of time and eternity. So he says, not only is he the builder, the founder, the architect, the owner, and the sustainer, he promises that it will perpetuate through eternity, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So there is no authority that will win or prevail against the church. Now, someone can prevail against me, as an individual Christian, someone can prevail against you as an individual Christian. There have been Christians that have been martyred whose blood has been slain ever since Stephen in the book of Acts. But the church flourishes even with the blood of the martyrs. And every time institution of men try to snuff out the church, all it does is serve as a fuel, as a kerosene, as a fan to fan the flame. And it continues to spread. Because what it does, it creates the backdrop for people to stand up 
and to give their testimony of their unwavering commitment to Jesus Christ that even in the face of physical harm and danger and hurt, the loss of money and finance and reputation, they will not deny him. And their regal boldness and courage in the face of danger gives other people the reason to believe maybe there's something about what they believe. The church will always be relevant as long as there is a slice of people that love God enough to maintain a testimony, to keep the lamp burning, to keep the light on, to consent to say with their presence, with their time, talent, and treasure, with their sacrifice, with their commitment, we believe that we are part of an institution whose founder, architect, builder, and sustainer is God, and in the end, this institution will triumph when every other institution is basically extinguished into eternity. Is the church relevant? You better believe that it's relevant, and it is the only hope for a nation in which the seeds of his damnation and destruction is already sown when he decides to start excommunicating God from his politics, excommunicating God from his e economy, excommunicating God from the public square. And when this nation starts to say, in our own selves we trust, in our military we trust, in our economy we trust, in the, our technology we trust, Failing to acknowledge it's in God and God alone that we trust. So I just thought about to tell you, 40 years ago, a handful of folk, <laughs> just a handful of folk, stepped out and said, we believe that God has called us. We believe that God has to establish, establish the church, not to find the church. See, Jesus found the church. But people can establish local congregations as they're led by the Holy Spirit. So a handful of people decided that they would step out on faith and they believed that God would bless them and bless their efforts. Now, I was around, as a matter of fact, I just moved back to West Virginia in 1978, late 1978. The Grace Bible Church was started in late 1979. I'm going to tell you, people was laughing at them. Now, I wasn't laughing at them. But there were some people laughing. What they think they're going to do? What, what in the world they think? Why do they think they need to establish another church? Why do we need another church? Maybe because there was a need because the ones that existed wasn't doing what God wanted to be done. He wanted this one to do. But those people stepped out on faith. And there have been many reasons as to why this church should have gone on a long time ago. As a matter of fact, it could have been aborted right after it started. But because God, the Holy Spirit, was in the midst of it all, and those handful of people that God sustained the ministry in those early years, God has added people over the years, and God has given people to this ministry who love the church and who have supported it with their time, talent, and treasure, and their commitment, who've guarded its reputation, and we're still here. By the grace of God, we're still here. Maybe smaller in number than our peak days, but we're still here. And make no mistake about it, we got a testimony. Oh, they might talk about it and criticize them, but let me tell you something. When they need something, it's 304-342-3249. That's the number they call. When they need something, it's the Grace Bible Church email. When they really need help, when there's a big problem going on, when the shootings are going on, when there's a big feeling that is needed, when somebody needs to stand up somewhere, this is where they call. When somebody in the hospital now, not even from here, somebody tell them, we think you need to call Grace Bible Church, maybe they might help you. I say, well, how did you get this number? There's a whole lot of churches in the phone book, but somebody said, I should call Grace Bible Church. And I'm going to give you just one of many testimonies. Sister Janet Lawson just happened to be here. Somebody called, I don't know the people, they ain't never seen the people, they called from Charleston. Uh, Ari Moore Medical Center over in Kanoa City. They needed some food. Wife was in for a piece of operation. They didn't have nothing to eat, nowhere to go. I said, well, how did you get this number? Somebody said, if you call Reverend Watts at the Grace Bible Church, some kind of way, they'll figure out how to help you. Let me tell you how God works. So I'm thinking to myself, I don't know these people. I, so I called my daughter, who happened to work over at Charles Durham Medical Center in Kanoa City. She was off work that day. She called into the hospital. She tells them the situation. One of her friends there said, you know, we got these meal ticket plans where we can give people meal tickets to help them get some new water here. Now, this is what God did. So the Lord ended up with me making one telephone call, and we got enough meal tickets to eat for a whole week. That's how God works. That's how God works. 
And that's why the church will always be relevant. The best work this church does, nobody ever sees it, and they don't even know the work that is being done every single day by Tom and Phyllis Tolliver and other members of this church. We had two funerals this past week. And this is a good one for you. I'd been out of town and uh, late like the week before, so I got back home, of course, in time for church, and so I came to the church on Monday, <laughs> says Regina, and I got a ritual, like I kind of come to church, I go to Fellowship Hall, I walk through the church, just a bit, just kind of walk through talking, make sure nobody in here sleep, nothing like that. I walk up in here, and there's a body in here. I almost had a coronary. And the top was open. Because I came up from the bottom, and I come in and do me a little prayer, and I come in here, and my office, there's a, a box, and there's a body in the box. I almost had a heart attack. Almost had a heart attack right there on the spot. And I wouldn't even have time to call Dr. Stanton to come and get me. But in my absence, they decided that people needed help. Somebody needed help. He's not here. We'll do it. We'll make it happen. And they made it happen. Yesterday, we had a funeral yesterday. Sister Michelle Brown. People everywhere. Melvin, John Mitchell, uh, Brother Deacon Dias, Minister Sharon Ray here. Taking care of the people. Taking care of the people. Now, I know some of y'all are, are too proud. Let me tell y'all this right now. My knees are getting bad. I'm going to walk up on steps as long as I can. When I can't walk no more, ain't going to be no shame in my game. I'm going to put myself right down in that chair. <laughs> I'm going to put myself right down in it. I know I'm operating too. And move myself on up and down those stairs. We almost wore that thing out yesterday. All those things, and it blessed my heart, at least we can get the people up the step. And the people were so grateful that they could be taken care of. Now, most people didn't see this. They didn't see it, but we do this all the time. And every time I say, we don't do no more funerals, right? Well, I, I say it. And then I, somebody will call, and, you know, I know such and such and so and so, and they know such and such and so and so, and they know this member of the Grace Bible Church, and they know somebody. So what you going to do? We always try the best we can. But it's a testimony to this church. And so now, what the church isn't has become one of our most powerful assets. Let me tell y'all the secret, and I'm done. The people on the west side, they think we rich. <laughs> they, th they think we rich. They think the Grace Bible Church is rich, right? And one of the reasons they think that it's because of this building that God miraculously gave to us in the first place. Miracle. How we got this building. Absolute miracle. And I'll tell you more about that next week. An absolute miracle how we got the building that never went on the market. And we found out about it. And I came and talked to the preacher. And he said, we're not going to put it on the market. But we want y'all to have it. And then he came back and said, how much can y'all afford to pay? <laughs> I should have said nothing, but I didn't say that. They actually let us select the price that we thought was a fair price. Now, you ever heard of any business dealers like that? They let us set the price of what we thought was a fair price for the building. And then we set that as the price. Come to find out, Sister Mona was in good standing with, at the time, One Valley Bank. He had a good reputation. Good to be a good Christian person and have a good reputation at the bank, right? And the president, Ms. Phyllis Honor, liked Mona. And the small business lender, Crazy Phil Bright, liked Mona. <laughs> so we go up there in the bank now. We never taken up the $60,000 in a year ever in history. And we go up there in the bank. Say, well, the people said, we did this. We did this. We came back to the congregation, went talk to the bank. They said, well, you need to show that you're going to take in at least $90,000. We ain't never came nowhere in taking $90,000 back then. No, well, so we came back and said, everybody got to pledge what they're going to get. This is the truth. God my witness. <laughs> when the pledges came in, people pledged they was going to give $92,000. We took that piece of paper to the bank and said, well, this is what the people said they were going to do. <laughs> we didn't know that banking didn't work like that. 
And to our surprise, God had moved in Phil's Island, moved Phil Bright, everybody else. They said, okay, if y'all think y'all can do it, we'll lend you the money. Then the appraiser came back, Sister Regina, and the appraiser was worth almost $200,000 more than what they sold at the church for. Then the bank said, well, since the appraiser was worth almost $200,000 more than what they're going to sell to you for, y'all ain't got to, do to give us nothing down. <laughs> So we moved in here, didn't pay a penny to move in, right? And that's how God works. God is a good God. God is a good God. God is a good God. And that's why we are, everybody will show up every day next week. We're going to celebrate. Can you believe, Deacon Chauncey, that this building is paid for? Now, we were talking about moving over here. Everybody got nervous. I'll never forget one of the last meetings we had, and some of the fear was it would be embarrassing if they put us out, right? <laughs> we hadn't got the loan yet, Sister Janet. They hadn't closed yet. We hadn't moved in yet. But we was already talking about being evicted, right? <laughs> I said, let's just go ahead and try to get in first. And let's see if we, if we get in, then maybe God will help us to stay in. And that's how we got here. And that's how we got here. And then we end up being seven hundred thousand dollars in debt because they went out and bought all these property out here behind us, all these, these old raggedy buildings. Because we can have the slums on the back of us, and we didn't have no place to park anyway. And so now we seven hundred thousand dollars in debt. And I'm saying, my Lord, how are we gonna pay this? So I said, look, I will not leave until the church is paid for, right? At the time that they wanted me to leave, I thought that was insurance, right? It was kind of insurance policy, right? I can't believe it myself. Then everything is paid for. Then everything is paid for. And so we give our children something to work with. That's what we're supposed to do, aren't we? We will give our children something to work with. And we ought to celebrate that. God has blessed this church for 40 years. A lot of people have gotten saved. Many people have ministered to. People are helped every single day because of this church. Everything that I have done or tried to do for the last 25 years is only because of you. Anybody I've helped is because of you. Anything is because of you. Because you've taken care of me so I could try some of these crazy things. So I could try to work out here in this neighborhood to try to make a difference. It's all because of this church. Anything that I've done for 25 years, I owe the people of the Grace Bible Church. If anything happened, it was positive. It's only because of you. And you, don't, you will not know until you get to heaven the number of people that you have blessed. The number of people down the door. I was trying to get out here yesterday. Somebody saw my car. Sometimes I park over there in that church. Just because my car reminded me I'm not here. I park over behind the church because people see my car. I mean, they're just going to be coming. So I, so I was coming out the door, and two people came in the door. They said, we need to talk. We need to talk. I said, man, I'm trying to get out my son. My grandson got this football game. And I said, I got a few minutes. But it was a great conversation. It's a great conversation with some people that really needed somebody to talk to, right? And I said, Lord, I thank you. I had no intention of being here that long or being here that late, but I was here. And I was able to pray with these people, able to give them some clear direction. I thank you for the church. I thank you for the church. Amen? Amen? One quick update. My grandson, <laughs> Xavier, they won't let him run the ball. I told you about that last week. I told his coach, I said, look, you got Forrest Gump on your team. If you point him in the right direction, you got to tell him, point him in the right direction. Just give him the ball. What do you do, Brother Kenny? Last, next to last play of the game, some kind of way he got in the lineup. They gave him the ball. He ran and went and touched that. I told him, I said, you got Forrest Gump. <laughs> I said, you got Forrest Gump and you don't even know it. Y'all think, you just give, point him in the right direction, tell him which way to go, and give him the ball. So we, we, we're grateful for that. We got a lot of challenges with him, so I celebrate everything positive that happened with him. I build him up to the heavens, man. Because right now, he's not even in school. He's seven years old. Not even in school. They put him out of school for the third time. So we got to go to the board this week. You know, it's, uh, just, it's been a struggle every step of the way. But I'm believing God 
this, I'm believing this God's going to do something with this little boy, right? And we praying, and we've been to every doctor and everywhere we could go to to try to get some help, and we still believe in God. So every time something, something good happens, <laughs> I celebrate to the heavens. Amen? <laughs> Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for another day.